And thank you all for joining us today. It's gonna to be a great day of conversation to empower women in any stage of your career. And thank you, Sheila, for joining us today. Welcome. This is such an honor to be here. I'm very excited. I'm excited too. Yeah. I'm a little nervous too, I have to say. Oh, don't be. This listening to everything Nisa says about you, I'm exhausted listening oh, to. No. <laughs> We're all women, very powerful women. That's right. Yes. So, Sheila, you have been a trailblazer throughout your career. Everything you've done, it hasn't been just walk in and do your job. It's been walk in, clear the roads, move the obstacles, and make it happen. Right. You've done that in the entertainment industry and the sports industry and the hospitality industry. Not an easy thing to do, but very inspiring. And you bring a perspective to each one of those industries mm -hmm. that has really changed each one of the industries in a, in a great way. Thank you. So when I think about that and the theme of today with driving innovation, first help us understand who is Sheila Johnson? What is your brand? How do you portray yourself so that you can tr trailblaze like that in everything you do? Well, first of all, over the years, and I can get into that later, I've really had to get to know myself and what things I could really accomplish and where were my strengths and where my weaknesses were. The one thing that I've always wanted to make sure that I was, and that's a leader. And I think is, especially entering the hospitality business, um, this is a business that is really run by men. It's dominated by men. I go to these conventions from Forbes to the American Hotel Lodging Association, and there's all of these black suits. And then there I am. And I think more than anything, I want to stand out as a leader. And what I wanted to bring to this brand was unique luxury. I wanted to bring something that's so different. It's the authentic, the authenticity of what my guests should experience when they walk through the door. I want them to feel at home. I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to understand that I'm going to provide excellence in service, that um, you're going to see professionalism all over this resort. And in, and in my other resorts, I mean, and above all, respect. It's not only respect for the guests that come through here, but also the respects, respect for my employees. I want that exchange to be transparent when they come to bring them a drink I also want to recognize them by name and thank them and I think more than anything we've lost all of that I mean so many people will go to hotels and you know they'll bring them the drink and you know just say thank you or anything but you don't see the the true leadership in there and I think that's what women bring to their businesses there there's a different kind of feeling that emotion comes it's into play as emotion, part of your leadership. And I feel so emotional even when I drive up in the front and I greet my valets, you know. Um, it's pride. Right. It's pride. Right. And I will have, you know, my chief of staff will be in the car and she'll say, look at what you've built. And she's been with me forever. <laughs> she's been with me from the very beginning. And I said, yes, I know. She says, aren't you proud of it? I said, there's days when I can't believe I've done this. So. Absolutely. And the fact that she's been with you forever says something about your leadership as well, because well, people like their leaders. My they employees stay do leaders. stay with us. Yes, that's fantastic. Yeah. So what you say, it sounds so natural and just a part of who you are. Mm -hmm. But I know that with your history, you've had struggles along the way. Oh, yeah. Being the, the only African-American in an all-white school growing up, moving around um, with your, your father, who was a doctor, very great in his field, but having to move around for his job. Um, also, you know, music was in your background and right. you wanted to pursue that and received a scholarship as the first African-American right. to do that as well. But there were struggles along the way. It didn't come easy. So could you maybe talk a little bit about in order to bring that leadership style to this amazing resort that we're sitting at today, mm -hmm. you had to face those struggles. What are those struggles that you faced and, and, and is it more because you were African-American? Was it more because you are a woman in going through these, these industries? It's really a double-edged sword. Okay. I think bottom line, the word is respect. I had over the years had to fight every minute of every day and every day of every month and every month of every year to really 
garner this respect of people that were around me because I went into areas that African American women really didn't go into, like learning to play the violin, right. um, being the only African American at the University of Illinois School of Music. And like my father, who was one of 11 African American neurosurgeons in the country at the time and couldn't practice in white hospitals, I had to follow his lead and watch through his strength how he was able to fight the fight, but not yet put it in your face. If you did the work and if you showed up on time, if you did everything you were supposed to do, we always thought we would get respected, but it normally didn't happen that way. We never really got that um, recognition that we so much deserved. And I just remember all through my life, even in school where I was probably the best in my class, but I still didn't get that award or I was the best violinist. And I mean, it took years for me to finally win an all-state competition. But I was still looked at with the side eye. Why are you playing the violin? We don't see people like you play the violin. Mm -hmm. But I stuck with it. It was that perseverance. And I just used that double-edged sword to the best of my ability because I wanted to be the best. Right used it to help you rise to the challenge rather yes. than become that block to, yes. to ri rise yes. to the challenge. My watch keeps going We off. love that you wear technology. That's I'm what we're sorry. here. That's I what know, it's all about, Sheila. It's just, okay. Jeez. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> it's all good, Sheila. So as you're going through and thinking these things, a um, little off script here, but I am curious. Did your parents raise you to, did you know that they were raising you to trailblaze all these careers and that every one of those struggles was, was giving you something to stand on and, and helping you rise to that challenge? Or did you always think it was going to oppress you and that you were gonna have to act differently growing up? What was that, well, that like growing all, up? First of all, my uh, mother told me to never say no to anything. Okay. She said, you can always do whatever you put your mind to it. And there were times where I just said, you know, Mom, I just give up. And she says, I don't ever want to hear you say that. I love that. Never. You have got power, and you need to use it. And that's what was really something that has always stuck out in my mind. I could do anything I could put my mind to it. And what I had to do is I really had to muzzle out those voices around me saying, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. Those are toxic people that come into your life. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to do a lot of soul searching over the years. And I'm not saying that it came to me easily. I, you know, I had fears. I stumbled. Uh, but I learned from that. I didn't let those fears and that stumbling set me back. I kept pushing forward. And that's what's really important. But I have to say, and you know, I had two good parents. A lot of people and a lot of young women don't have that. And so they've either got to find someone that really believes in them, that can really help continue to, you know, smile on them or give them that God wink, as they say, mm -hmm. and say, you can do that. Mm -hmm. It could be a teacher. And I had good teachers in my life that really were able to see my abilities and really stood by me. I did as well. Mentors became a huge part of yes. who I was yes. and, and giving me that confidence to put my next exactly. step forward. So I love that concept. Yeah. I appreciate that. So as you were going through this, did you feel that there was one pivotal moment in your career that said, I am Sheila Johnson and I am going to change the world. I'm going to change the world of sports and everything that I do, or I'm going to change the world of entertainment. Well, first I had to change the world with myself. And that pivotal moment in my life was I had to step out of a very abusive marriage. Mm. And that was really important. I had to make up my mind that I had to stop being fearful of being able to step out on my own. I had two young kids, but I was really, really unhappy. And I had to do something to, as my mother said, girl, you need to get your power back. And that was to step out, to have the courage to step out of something that was so toxic because here I had a young daughter who was looking up to me and she even kept saying mom you got to do something mm -hmm. and I had a, a young son who I also wanted to set an example for and I just had to get through that fear and so many women go through this can I make it on my own can I really 
gather my own footing? How can I move forward? What is it going to be like for me financially? I mean, luckily for me, I helped build a company and I was able to get my fair share, but I still had to fight right. for every bit of it. And I had to plan for that fight. I mean, you just don't get up and do something haphazardly. And then through all of that, I had to learn to love myself again. You know, love is a battle and it can be a war, but that battle that you win or the war that you win is the one with yourself. And you've got to learn to love yourself more than anything in the world. And that's what's going to continually push you forward. And I think you're going to have all these battles in life, but you have to learn how to accept them and to be able to step through the fear of what's going to happen. I love that. Yeah. We're only a few minutes in and we've already heard about perseverance, respect, courage, yes. loving yourself, which defines much of who you are. Yes. And you, you, you then jump in as the first African-American female of uh, the sports industry, owner of three sports teams. Yes. Right? Which... I can't imagine owning one, let alone three, and um, having to really pave the way again after you did that in entertainment television, after you already had um, you know, so much going on in your personal life, rebuilding everything right. that you were thinking of. And then you're able to bring this really female perspective to a very male-dominated industry again. So can you tell us a little bit about how you became involved as a partner of Monumental Sports and um, your proudest moment with Monumental Sports and Entertainment? Well, I'm going to start with the proudest moment. Okay. And that was winning the World Championship Woo -woo! in Washington Mystics. And, you know, people think, oh, well, that must have been easy. I bought that team way back in 2005. <laughs> and what I went through just trying to put together the right players – finding the right coach, finding the right general manager, it's like putting pieces of a puzzle together that just don't fit. Yeah. And you go through years and years of mistakes. And, and so often I would question myself, I've never owned a sports team. How in the world am I going to figure this out? But then I looked at other team owners. They were going through the same thing. You know, sometimes they were just lucky and they were able to put it together right. But I finally started sitting down and I started to equate putting together the best team is like building a company. Okay. You have got to be able to find the right people, especially, and swallow your pride, find people that know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They have to be smarter than you. So I started doing a little investigation of bringing people around me, especially a coach that really understood the sport. Did you play basketball? No. <laughs> Listen, this was before Title IX. Yeah, I was right. lucky I could walk around the track. Right. I was a cheerleader. Right. But it was just, you know, how things work in a locker room is the same way how things work in a corporation. You have to have the right chemistry and bringing in the right chemistry of players. And I realized I really didn't know all the players in the WNBA. Right. I had to bring in someone who understood the nuances, who understood the personalities, understood the talent, and how do you bring a power forward in, and how do you bring a center in, and how do they work together? So luckily, after many, many mistakes and finishing last in the conference time and time again, I didn't feel dejected. I got smarter about it. Mm -hmm. And finally hired the right coach who put together the right group of players that really were in sync in the locker room. Now, how I got into the sports industry is, is really another lesson in life. I um, had always known a man by the name of Abe Poland, who at the time owned the Wizards. Okay. Well, at one point, he owned the Caps and the Wizards. Mm -hmm. Then Ted Leonsis came along, bought the Caps, and Abe Poland actually lived in a farm behind me. And we were always good friends. And this is a lesson of never, ever burning your bridges. Love that. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I was always good to Mr. Poland. And one day I was helping his wife, Irene, with something. And he says, Sheila, I want you to come to my office next Tuesday. I went to the office and I couldn't even sit down. He says, I want you to buy the Washington Mystics. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I said, why me? And he says, why not you? He says, you should be the face of this team. 
Had you thought about getting into the never. sports industry at this point? Never. Never. This was given to me as an opportunity of a lifetime. And I remember he says, this is highly confidential. I need your answer, like in the next 24, 48 hours. I said, but let me see the financials. I'm looking at them. I'm like, this team isn't making a dime. <laughs> I'm like, this is the poorest business decision I could ever make. But I wanted to think of the long term and what right. it could bring. Not only to a new franchise. So I went to my attorney. I called him on the phone and I said, um, Sandy, um, I've been just offered to buy a team. He says, you're not going to buy a team. He says, why should you buy a team? I said, what was if it was offered to you? And he paused. I said, you just gave me my answer. Right. I said, I'll be in your office in 15 minutes, but I have another idea. And I said, there's a man by the name of Ted Leonsis. He says, I know Ted. I said, he has first right of refusal to the Wizards. And I said, if I could bring the Mystics in on this, I would like to come in as a partner. Not a penny more, not a penny less. I want to become a partner of Lincoln Holdings. We called Ted, and this is another terrific man who just said, you know what, this may be a good idea. I said, yeah, you can get a twofer. You can get a woman and an African-American. <laughs> and I said, there's no one else. Exactly. <laughs> And it, of all the team sports, it can have that. And he just kind of laughed and he said, okay, let me bring it to the rest of the partners and let's see. But these are two exceptional men who really opened the door for me personally to be a team owner. And it, it has just been amazing ride, an amazing ride. I, I cannot tell you how great Ted Leonsis is. And it's been so open to having me is vice chairman of Monumental Sports. And it's, it's just been amazing. So do you think there's something the unique that you brought to the table as a female or as an African-American to owning these teams? The, the Mystics won the championship, the Caps have won the championship recently. So are you bringing something unique that's bringing that together? You, you really had to shape the Mystics, right? Well, so I just showed up at Caps games. <laughs> I don't think I brought much perspective okay. there, okay. except to meet a lot of nice yeah. people. Yeah. But for the Mystics, what happened there was pride within the players. Mm -hmm. When I remember walking out on the basketball court and they stood up and applauded. And I remember Elena Beard and so many of the others, they said, you just made history. You're the first woman to buy a WNBA team and you're African American. That gave them yeah. so much pride and I felt Unbelievable. I mean, I did stupid stuff. I came out on a motorcycle with a cop, you know, and the whole <laughs> arena was lighting up, you know, and they were cheering and everything. And then I'd get out on the floor and dance. Then I'd bring my violin out and I'd play. I became like a one woman yeah. show <laughs> because I was just so proud to be an owner. Right. And then after it all settled in, I said, I need to stop doing this <laughs> nonsense. But you know, it was my way of connecting with my audience, and they've been just so supportive. They've been just amazing. I love that. Yeah. You know, at, at GDIT, we really think that in order to bring more women into technology, you yeah. have to be able to see yourself. And I think you've done the same thing for the sports industry, that yeah. it's easier for more women to come into the sports industry now because they see themselves in oh, you. Yeah. And we now see female coaches on the sidelines. You of see that. And more and baseball, female ownership. Right? Absolutely. I mean, another, you know, the Seattle Storm won the championship this year. And... Jenny is just an amazing owner. Yeah, that's you right. Know. That's right. So thank yeah. you for, for changing the industry and being the shoulders yeah. that we can all stand on going forward. And um, I know my daughter wants to be one of those, so I'm excited for her, and, and I appreciate that. So, you know, as, as well as, you know, being the, um, the owner of uh, the Washington Mystics and, and part of Monumental Sports, you know, you really do bring that same trailblazing attitude, perseverance, respect, leadership to, to the hospitality industry as well, um, as we can see by this lovely uh, Salamander Resort and Spa that we're, we're sitting in today. And we, we believe at GDIT that that diversity really brings about innovation. So can you speak to a little bit about how, as an African-American trailblazer, you've brought about specific innovation into any of the industries you've been involved with, whether it's entertainment, sports, hospitality? You know, what, what perspective do you bring to these that is, has brought new innovation? You know, that's... 
the only innovation that I can think that I brought in is not only just my ideas, but one thing that people do not realize, and I'm going to draw back on my very beginnings of the importance of the arts. Mm -hmm. You know, I have such a huge foundation in the arts with the violin and graduating, you know, from the University of Illinois in arts. Um, I was able to take that foundation because the arts really help you to focus. They're discipline. The discipline is there. Organization skills. It teaches you how to listen, how to watch. If you're sitting in an orchestra, you're watching that conductor. You're listening to all the other sounds. So I am able to listen to what people are saying and to be able to comment and answer them. I think everything musically. I right. really do. Right. Even when I walk in, I have a theme song going through my head or something <laughs> like that. It's, it's just a very calming way to live. So I take my arts foundation, and as I brought it into the entertainment industry with BET, there were different, definite messages that I wanted to give. I was very unhappy. I, I knew what we wanted to do with that. But it, BET then evolved into more of a video market, mm -hmm. which I wasn't happy with. I didn't like the way women were being portrayed in the videos. So I started a show called Teen Summit. And Teen Summit was to really talk with especially young men and women, and especially those women, to understand the effects that media have on their life and to start making really smart decisions of how they dress for school or go to school or just any kind of decision, whether it could be dating. And we talked about these issues. And I remember bringing uh, some parents in and I said, what is it about your children that you would like to find out about? <laughs> this was very, <laughs> this, I'll never forget this. And a couple of them were very open. They said, mom, well, I'm having sex. And the woman f passed out. I mean, just <laughs> passed out. I said, will you, and the whole purpose was to really open up communication sure. with their sons and their daughters. But this was a really important trailblazing show because then we were then given a grant through the Kaiser Foundation, through the Clinton administration, to really talk about um, teen pregnancy because it was like going off the roof right. at this right. point. And so these were things that I was able to address by using the importance of media and being able to do that. And then we were able to take the show on the road. And I had my experts with me, mm -hmm. but we did reduce the teen pregnancy. I don't know what the right. percentages were, right. but they said we, we were really, and I worked with the Brookings Absolutely. Institute on that. So that's just one example. And then getting into the hospitality industry, the arts comes back in mm -hmm. where I'm able to design the sheets on the bed, I've designed all the photography that's here. I do the photography, um, the music that's piped through, this furniture, all of it. I chose it. Right. I knew in right. my head what I wanted this place to look and feel like. But that's because of my arts and the foundation of how I see the world in music. I mean, I, I look at things visually. It's like putting together a movie. Right. And it's just, and this is my movie. You're the ultimate composer at the end I of the day. I compose producer, all right? of this of and music. the producer, yeah. director. I love it. You name it. I love but it. that's how I've been able to bring all of this together. Well, and, and you can see how it all kind of built on that experience that you brought, right. that, that yes. perspective that you brought in as a mother, as a leader, as an African-American right. from entertainment to sports to hospitality. It all built on one another. It's it not is. that you had to separate and compartmentalize. It all right. as a whole made you better. And everything that comes into here, I mean, we, have a, we're, we just finished our eighth year of a film festival. We have brought in every film that has won the Academy Award. Congratulations. All of the films that we've brought in here are either gone for SAG Awards, Golden Globe, um, you know, yeah. Oscars, yeah. you uh -huh. name it. We've had Maggie Gyllenhaal here. We've had Dee Reese here. We have the diversity of films. Right. We've had... Um, uh, every film... <laughs> I'm just yeah. drawing a blank. So it, you know, from Green together. Book to Spotlight to... 
imagination game, you have no idea. And the directors have come. We are now in the top 10 of film festivals ranked. It's amazing. You know, in this little old town called Middleburg, In this little Virginia. town, and we take over the whole town. We show films. It has become so popular. It went from about 1,800 people, and now we're about close to 8,000. That's amazing. And it's well done. just been magical. And it's brought so much to the town. I mean, sure. we've put it on the map. I mean, in, in a beautiful way. Right. In a beautiful way. Right. I mean, to be able to have a town that was so closed, just about horses, which nothing is wrong with right. that. Mm -hmm. But we were able to bring the art of storytelling to this town where we, after our films, we sit in this very room and we have conversation with directors, with actors, to talk about how they put their films together, why they decided to put these films together. We bring controversial documentaries in. I mean, we just had dissent on the uh, Khashoggi murder. I mean, it was intense. Mm -hmm. And is that an intentional part of what you're doing to bring right. those tough topics out into the forefront? I want people to start collaborating, to start talking, to start being transparent in their thinking. They need to communicate. We need to talk with one another. I don't care what side of the political aisle you're in, you're, but let's, let's get together right. and let's talk civilly. Right. And that's the whole purpose of bringing the arts together so that people can really be able to become friends again. I love and that. And that's what's so important. And I have the vehicle here. This is just one of my vehicles. Right. Uh, to be able to do this. And I just love having this resort because I just come up with all sorts of ideas, whether it's concerts in the living room mm -hmm. or it's bike racing outside on our trails, zip lining, you name it. But this is the reason why this place is here. I love that. So speaking of here, we are in the middle of a pandemic yes. that has really had an impact on the hospitality industry. Sports. And, and sports industry as well, right? Yes. And, and now we see that numbers are rising again across the globe and you're having to lead through this crisis all of your many businesses. So yeah. can you just give us a little bit of a feel of what that impact has been and how you've been leading uh, your companies through this crisis? Well, first with the hospitality business, I, um, I can't say I, I was worried, but I wasn't fearful. Okay. And I would get together with my team and I said, you know, this is what's happening on the horizon. I know we have to shut down because we have to follow the orders of the state. And one thing that I learned during that shutdown was that I came into this building. The thing that just distressed me was to see a lock, a padlock on the front doors. So I called my general manager. I said, we're going to walk through the building. And the building was so sad. You could yeah. see the cobwebs. You could mm. see pigeons out there making their, building their own homes right. out there. I mean, the building just lost its life. And we don't realize that when people aren't in buildings, they get very sad. The wood starts to deteriorate. I never thought about a building being a living, breathing place, but it is. Right. And I walked through here and I said, Reggie, let's find the bright light here. This is the time where we're going to do deferred maintenance. I said, you bring about 11 to 15 men in here and we're going to start working it. We redid the floors. We cleaned everything. We replaced mattresses. We did whatever we could. And because I said, we're going to open one day. And when we open, we are going to open on top. And sure enough, on June 13th, we reopened. The place was spotless. We were sold out. I love that. People were like, oh my God. But that takes absence of fear. You've got to think leadership. You've mm -hmm. got to be a leader. You cannot show your employees that you're fearful or scared. And what can we do? But I also had to protect my employees. Right. We applied for the fundings that we had to do. I wanted to make sure they were able to help with their unemployment and, you know, to do whatever we could to keep them not only engaged, but to keep them economically healthy. And that's because I love my employees. So that's just one example. Now, on the sports side, mm -hmm. <laughs> we all got on a Zoom call, and Ted and his team are just unbelievable. 
he just laid out, he says, this is what the numbers look like. He says, we can't open. We have no fans in the seats. We're going to lose X, Y, and Z. We got to make all these economic cuts. And then the NBA says, we're going to go into a bubble. And the WNBA said, we're going into a bubble. And I would sit, I've never sat on so many calls of how this was going to work. <laughs> the bubble worked. They constantly got tested. We moved the girls into the Tampa area. The men were in Orlando. And I was talking with my coach not too long ago, and he says it was the best experience. He says those girls grew up. But getting back to the economic side, Ted and his team did such an exceptional job to make sure that we were going to see a light at the end of the tunnel. It's planning, planning, planning. We had to look at the numbers. We had to lay everybody off. That was heartbreaking um, in order to save money. Right. And you just have to step out of that fear, and you've got to run a business. You've got to do what you have to do. And everybody understood um, all of my staff that I kept on, they took 50% pay cut. I mean, you just do those things, but everyone understood. Right. First, you're worried about, are they going to understand? They're going to leave me. Da, 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 da. You roll the dice and say, look, I love you all, but we're not making any money right now. Mm -hmm. So this is what we have to do. I love that. So yeah. you controlled what you could. You, you saw it as an opportunity, right. and I love the way you said that, you know, you learned from this, right? Oh, and, we and really learned, to yes. So in, in um, Forbes magazine, it was uh, cited that one in four women are leaving the workforce due to COVID, which really is, is setting us back, right? That we are only 50% yeah. of the workforce. Now we're, we're losing one in four because of all the other responsibilities right. we have of trying to help to... Uh, do schooling with our children or take care of our parents who might be high risk and, yeah. and can't go out and all those things that we naturally do. Are you seeing that show up in the sports and hospitality business as well? I don't know what's quite going over at the CAP Center right now. Okay. This is everyone's laid off. Right. Um, in the hospitality section, we've been able to keep most of ours afloat. It's more the people that I'm hearing about on the news and right. what is really happening it's really undermining workforce equity. Yeah. And that's what I worry about. Just as we were starting to see an upward swing of more and more women getting CEO positions, a little bit on boards, not much. Mm -hmm. That's still a problem. But just as they were gaining in the workforce, then this happened. And who's going to get laid off first? They're going to get laid off first. You know, and this is... The burden is put on them. Right. I really, really do worry about it. I worry about it. I'm so thankful that I have my own business and I can somehow control my life and I just feel really bad and I try to take the responsibility of helping the women in my office. They rotate, we have fun, we have wine Fridays or champagne Fridays, whatever, you know, just to that. keep them happy and, and we do things. Um, but I do, I do worry about all that. But I, I have to control what I can control. And what I can only say to CEOs out there of these companies, do not forget about the women. You need to call them. You need to reach out to them. Find something for them, even if they just do Zoom calls. Make sure that they stay engaged. Make sure you stay engaged with them. They are an important part of your workforce. And if you lose them, your company's gonna fail. That's right. I am sending, I am raising the red flag. Your company will fail because you need the diversity of thought, you need the strength of those women out there, and it is really important. Right. So stay engaged with them. You've heard it here first. You will fail if you let all of your women uh, leave the <laughs> workforce. So I love that. Yeah. And I also heard Champagne Fridays, which I am all on board with. So I think that's a great idea. Yeah. 
So, Sheila, if you don't mind, we thought we'd open it up for questions Certainly. for our um, virtual audience here so that they can be a part of the conversation as well. Okay. So for those of you that are um, online and enjoying this conversation, we uh, encourage you to enter a question in the Q&A box. And we'll try to get to as many as we can here as we've been going. So as we're waiting for everybody to do that, we, we already have one question in the loop, which is we've been talking about how to maintain personal and leadership sustainability during a year that's been so stressful with no resolution in, in, in sight. What have you been doing as in your own personal strategies to, to deal with this, this stress that just continues to go on? First of all, I'm, I don't like to boast about how lucky I am. I live on a farm, okay? <laughs> my farm has got lots of air, and I can go out and I can walk my farm. I can look at the horses outside. We've got an overabundance of rabbits and deer now because nobody's around. But the thing that I have full circle taken back around, I have taken up the cello. And Very nice. And I take cello lessons. And I have so much fun. I get up in the morning, and at 8.15 in the morning is my scales. And then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that's when I work on my repertoire. Uh, so I went from violin playing to cello playing. And um, I don't sound really great on the cello because <laughs> this is something new I've taken up. But I wanted to do something that was going to really retrain my brain and to also just make me take my mind off of what's going on out there. What could I do to improve myself? And I think that that's what every woman needs to do. Yeah, she needs to figure out what is it, if it's just taking a walk. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, um, I've, I've got great women in my office. We have one man and we, we give him hell. But anyway, <laughs> we have all these wonderful women in my office and we just, they, even though they rotate, someone's there, and we reconnect, mm -hmm. and we'll sit in the office in the morning, there's not that much to do, and we will have coffee together, and we'll either tell dirty jokes or good jokes or just talk about life, but just we let our hair down, and it just breathes life yeah. into our day. Remind ourselves that we're human. We're right? human. We're all human, yeah. so, and we need to connect. And the man love loves our dirty jokes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Offline, we'll have to talk about some yeah, of those jokes. So not that's that great. dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So um, another question for you, Sheila. How can women who are disproportionately impacted from the pandemic with childcare and work issues more successfully navigate this new terrain? Do you have any suggestions for them? Well, I think, first of all, this is tough. I mean, I don't know what their neighborhoods look like, but they really need to make friends either with the neighbor or someone that has children. Practice smart social distancing or whatever we have to do, washing hands, mm -hmm. but we've got to maintain connection. Right. Even if you all, like if your kids go over to their house and you can take a break and so forth and so on, but there's got to be some kind of relief there. And you know, I don't have the answers to everything, but I just think, I have seen it happen with even, even though I live on a farm, there's families that live on sure, my farm sure. and they do rely on each other for help. I love and that. it's really helped a lot. Yeah. I think that connection is really big. We're finding that at GDIT, that ability yeah. to connect is something really important. We're having a Halloween party tomorrow for yeah. our, our families to ensure that, you know, they're, they're remembering that that's right. a part of, of I mean, who we even FaceTiming. I mean, my grandbaby put me in the Easy Bake Oven. <laughs> I mean, she just lights out. <laughs> I mean, but I loved it. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> So another question for you, mm -hmm. if you will. What advice would you have for young women trying to advance their career from a lower level manager to the executive suite? We have a lot of college recruits on, the girls going to college and early in their career, so I'm sure they would love to hear how you, oh boy. what you would say. I could write a book on this. Well, first of all, especially young ones, and I've made these mistakes too, make sure you set boundaries, okay? Make sure that the people, first of all, really get to know who you are and where you think your journey's gonna go. It's not gonna be mapped out the way you want it because you know, you're gonna take detours on the way. You have to stay positive. And I'm gonna go back to setting boundaries because so often, especially young women, we let people in our lives 
that are very toxic. And I've learned this the hard way. And especially if you have a lot on the ball and they can really see that you're going to rise throughout your life. I call them energetic vampires. <laughs> yeah. They will jump on your tail in a right. minute and ride with you until they can take everything from you. Mm. So you've got to set those boundaries and be careful who you let in your life. And your, your friends are going to change over the years. Mm -hmm. Some of them aren't going to be able to keep up with you. Some are going to try and pull you down. You've got to be fearless and break out of that box that you're in. And I tell young people and I tell my kids, they go, Mom, I'm so tired. I've been working so hard. I said, keep working harder. Just keep working harder. Keep your sights on what you need to do. Never give up. Never give up. Because that. that's what the salamander is. It's about perseverance, courage, and fortitude. But it's all about patience and hope also. I love that. And that's what they need to do. And I recite this to my employees. I recite it to young people. I recite it to my kids. But that is what you need to do is never get up, give up. When they say you're tired, you're not tired enough. Right. You just keep working hard and you will make it. I love that. That, that work ethic is something I actually look for when I, when I right. hire my team, is that that work ethic goes a really long way oh, to yeah. what we're doing. So try again. So another question for you. Um, we'll take this one as part of your, your musical background, okay. right? So a fun one. What is your theme song or your walk-up song? You said you always have a song in your head. Um, and uh, this person would love to know what is inspiring you and prepares you for your pivotal meetings. Well, my theme song is, I'm every woman, uh, it's one. all in me. You can sing too, you know. Oh, thank you. And we dance to it in the office. <laughs> See, we all get up and we dance to this song. Love it. And it's, that's my theme song that I can do. And what was the other part of you? And um, it was, um, what prepares you for your pivotal meetings? So a meeting that's going to make, make oh, big change. I do my homework. You do your homework. I do my uh, homework. Planning again, huh? Yes, it's planning. It's what's going to be the goal of this meeting. What is it? I, I, I see what the meeting's about, but what is it that I need to convey? What is it I need to teach my team and show as leader how we're going to proceed forward and what we're going to do? And that's the way I prepare. You've got to be prepared. I love that. Yes. All right. Well, Ms. Sheila, this is, we are wrapping up here, mm -hmm. and um, I thank you for this amazing conversation. Oh, this was fun. Yes, absolutely. And we've learned so much about your leadership style, that you bring respect and courage and perseverance. You put your employees first, and you, you make sure to show that love and, and that emotion right. in everything that you do, and you bring that work, work ethic to, to really yes. think about those obstacles with uh, good preparation and planning to, right. to achieve those. This wonderful place that we're sitting in, so cozy by the fire here, I know it means a lot to you. And you just started to reference it with the salamander and what it yes. means. But can you tell us a little bit of the story about the salamander and why it's called that and, and what it really means to you? Yes. Um, there was a show that young people probably don't know about it, but it is playing on Nickelodeon. It's called Hogan's Heroes. Oh, yes. So there, uh, Colonel Hogan, whatever it was, uh, in real life, the farm that I bought was from this man okay. who was the Hogan or Bruce Sunland. Bruce Sunland was a fighter pilot that was shot down over Nazi-occupied Belgium. Um, all of his uh, comrades unit were captured in a POW camp. He was able to escape fled across Europe on bicycles, ended up in France, which was allied territory. And uh, the U.S. came in and they said, look, we have got to go back. We've got to get them out. And they said, well, how, he said, well, how are we going to do this? He says, we're going to set this up, but we've got to go back and do it. We're going to give you the code name Salamander. And he goes, well, that's great. He goes, well, salamanders are really important to France. Okay. King Louis XIV had salamanders all around his moat because he felt as though the salamanders kept him safe. So anyway, they went back, and of course, they were very successful in getting his unit freed. And so when I spoke with him, I said, um, 
I kind of like that name. And I was going through a period in my life where I was making some big changes. And um, I said, what does the salamander mean? And he says, well, young lady, it's the only animal that can walk through fire and still come out alive. I'm like, I want that. I want that because I'm walking through fire now and I'm going to come out alive. He said, but you know, also if you chop off its limbs, they regenerate. I said, I even want it more. <laughs> and so that's when I came up with the whole slogan of per, uh, perseverance, courage, and fortitude. And I said, can I use that as my brand? And he said, it's fine with me. So I hired this all-woman's firm, and they did the, the logo of the salamander, which has won every award in the book. And um, to make a very long story short, it's working. Absolutely, yeah. it's working. This is amazing. And I love that, that concept of, of how you walk through fire and come out the other side, because yes. that essentially is what you've done your entire life and yeah. really career in building this amazing uh, resort that you have and, and building your brand with the Mystics right. and, and coming out successfully there as thank well. Thank you. Sheila, thank you for inspiring all of us, all of us that are online. Thank you for being a part of the conversation. So and much. I'm so thankful to be here. And I, I thank you for, for just giving us all words of wisdom to You're live so by. You're so welcome. This so. was fun. Thank you. So for those of you online, I ask you to think about uh, what you can do over this next break, what you just learned from Sheila. And in 15 minutes, we're going to come back for our very first panel. So think about which one you want to join and we'll see you soon.